Hi, this is Paul Roos, and this is Uncommon. This podcast is brought to you by Neural Media. Are you an entrepreneur or marketer who needs help making podcasts, video, or animation? Perhaps you don't have time to manage a freelancer or the budget to deal with an agency. Well, Neural Media can help you with simple and affordable content creation, saving you time and money by taking away the pain of producing that content. To learn more, head to neural.com slash media. That's N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E.com slash media. Play around with our pricing or request a callback directly. Listeners to the show receive a special discount by using the promo code UNCOMMON. Welcome to another episode of UNCOMMON. My name is Jordan Michaelides and I'm your host. In this episode, I have for you Paul Roos. Paul is the former coach of the Sydney Swans Football Club and Melbourne Football Club. He's the director at Performance by Design, a commentator at Fox Footy and husband to Tammy Roos. Roosy, as he's commonly known, is undoubtedly one of Australia's greatest thinkers on leadership. I think his constant focus on process, the sort of lead over lag measure approach was incredibly new in a field that often leads with experimentation and and that really earned him the rare status as an authority. So I couldn't help but jump at the opportunity to have Paul on the show. We covered a lot in this episode, as always, including nostalgia and history, leadership and sport versus business, life balance and parenting, marrying your best friend, processes and goals, and of course, his leadership principles as well. If you liked the episode, do leave us a rating on your podcast app. Uh, Many thanks to those who left a recent review. It's just, we love, absolutely love reading them, uh, particularly Calmore, P7F and B Writ. Um, in America. Thanks, guys, for those review, reviews. rather. We still have the competition going for the Empathy Wine, so only this week. Uh, it'll finish probably Monday the 9th of September, I believe. So we've got a special promo for our listeners. As part of Gary's trip, we had a case of Empathy Wine prepared. So now that all those bottles of wine are left, we have a competition for four people to snap up their very own bottle of Empathy wine, uh, the rosé wine. As well, I just heard that Vino Mofo in Australia has completely sold out of the Empathy Wine rosé as well. Uh, Winners can either choose to get it posted to them or you can come into the studio and meet us in Melbourne. Uh, To enter, just check out our posts in the link tree on Instagram. Share with your friends on Instagram as well. Tag us at uncommon underscore podcast. To watch the episode in full, search Uncommon Podcast on YouTube and don't forget to like and subscribe. Show notes and all previous guests are at neural.com slash podcast. With that being said, thanks for listening, guys. I hope you'll enjoy this conversation with Paul Ruse. Paul, looks like we're live. Beautiful. <laughs> Excellent. How Thank are you? you. Yeah, good. How are you? Not too bad. Um, I, I've always, we like to get into sort of openers and icebreakers to start and it was a hard one to find uh find one on you but i did enjoy mike sheen's interview and this whole reference to the sundance kid does anyone actually say that at all or is this just some random piece of fact that he found from somebody well it's kevin sheedy so sheets who's known to um give people nicknames and there's obviously a character and an icon of the game um, I can't remember in what context, but at one stage he called me the, the Sundance Kid. So that's it really hasn't stuck. I think he's the only one that's used it. And obviously Mike, being the journalist that he is, uh, found it quite amusing. Um, <laughs> it's been, I think Kevin's used it a couple of times, but it hasn't sort of hit the mainstream yet. Yeah, I think the one thing that stands out when we posted about your interview on social media was the... The feeling that people had when they used to chant your name at the MCG, whether they were Melbourne or Sydney supporters. But I think the Melbourne supporters uh, love that in particular because it gave them uh, some hope. I, growing up in sort of the Bentley Brighton era, most of my friends were either St Kilda supporters, as I am, or Melbourne supporters. Um, so it's always interesting to, to get the, the little notes about you, even though it was three years. Um, about your time at Melbourne. How are you feeling about the season so far? 
Yeah, it's been frustrating. I think it's frustrating for all the Melbourne supporters. Um, yeah, because I I think when you get to a footy club, you know, I start at Fitzroy and you get immersed in the Fitzroy football club. I barrack for Carlton as a kid. But when you get to a club, and people always ask me, who do I barrack for? It's very different when you're a player or coach. You, yeah. You're part of the club. It's not like you barrack for someone. It's, it's, it's That's your life, you know. So when you're involved at Fitzroy, your life is Fitzroy. When you when you go to when I went to Sydney, my life is Sydney, and then when you arrive at Melbourne, even though you're only there for three years, which I knew, you, your whole life becomes the Melbourne Footy Club. So I learned a lot about the Melbourne Footy Club. Got a lot of friends. Learn about the pain of the Melbourne Footy Club in the previous sort of six years, you know, prior to me getting there. I think the year before they won two games. So that's that's the thing now when I'm um, looking at Melbourne. You yeah, you, you're immersed in it and you get emotionally attached to the club. So when you see it struggling again, when you see the club struggling, you, yeah, you feel part of it um, and you live it and breathe it. Do you have any feeling for Carlton anymore these days? No, not really. Although it's funny when I, I you know, with David T coaching now and obviously the, the, you know, the sort of success or the relative success, depending on what you call it. I mean, obviously they haven't had a lot of success. So winning games of footy is a great start. But just to hear the crowd, it's probably the only thing that takes me back to when I was a kid. You know, because they're, you know, they're, they're a big club. You know, they're Massive a club. big footy club. And yeah. I remember going to the 79 grand final and as a, as a supporter the year before I went to Fitzroy, actually, and we, we, with my mate and... Yeah, it probably took me back a little bit just to, <laughs> for those times to sort of think, oh, how cool was it when I was watching those players run around and Harmsy knocking the ball into and Peter Francis playing really good footy and and the before yeah you know, the mosquito fleet of Sheldon and and, and Alex Marcou and 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 Rod Ashman and all those great players that I I sort of idolised as a kid. So yeah, it took me back a little bit when I could hear the crowd roar when I'm watching them play of recent times. So the, what was your fondest memory? Was it the crowd or the enthusiasm? you had with your fan, like, for example, I love going to the footy as a St. Kilda spot. I'm not really going for the spectacle of uh, the game at the moment, but being there with uh, with family, like, there's no other situation where you can get three uncles, my dad and cousins, in a place at the same time unless it's Easter and Christmas. It's funny. Someone asked me a similar but different question the other day. I probably look at it the other way. I think the thing that I have missed out on as a player and a coach is exactly what you're talking about. Mm. Like the inability to take my wife and my two boys to the football to sit in the crowd. And I've only been able to do that a Uh few times. And I think having done that, I realised what I've missed out on. Having said that, what I've gained through the experience of being immersed in a footy club, whether it's Fitzroy, you know, Sydney or Melbourne, is vastly different. So it's a hard question to, to answer because when I was a young kid growing up barracking for Carlton, I played so much sport that I didn't actually go and watch Carlton much at all. Really? You know, I was playing you know, basketball and tennis and football. So all day Saturday when the games were played at 2.10, I was doing something, whether that was tennis or basketball, played my footy on the Sunday. So I didn't have much of that opportunity to do it with my dad because we would play sport and, and all that. So when you ask that question, it's more, I think what I've missed through being a coach and a player and and have only been able to do it maybe a handful of times, you know, during the period where I was not coaching Sydney between Sydney and Melbourne and, and post Melbourne. Um, and when I did it, I sort of realised some of the things that I was missing. But having said that, when I look at the picture of my sons and <laughs> in the certain yeah you know, two thousand five grand final picture, I realised that yeah what I gained was far greater than perhaps what I lost. Of course, it's so funny you mention uh, Carlton as well. I remember my my dad and my uncle always talk about hating Carlton the most. I don't know why. They just always say that every time they'd go down, there was a stand there. My uncle always, I feel like he's exaggerating, but he's like, oh, yeah, I got in a fight with Alphonse Gangitano. He was down there. He was a big supporter. But it's it's funny because if they had not, so my family's from Cyprus, and the option was you settle in St. Kilda or Carlton. So hence, most Greeks and Italians go for Carlton, but for some reason, he chose St. Kilda. And that was back when they were still at the Junction Oval. And... Um, you know, they may have been Carlton supporters and then, you know, we would have had uh, great success as supporters as well. I think that would have been a very, very funny, I think, in comparison. Yeah, look, I think, I mean, I'm 55 now, so probably the younger generation, you know, my kids probably don't 
well, they don't know the origin of, of where footy started. Yeah, VFL. Mm. I mean, VFL was extremely tribal. It was where you lived and, you know, who your parents followed. You know, my dad, um, you know, mum and dad were Carlton Collingwood sort of thing. So I had, I had both. And, it, you know, we probably you know, happened to grow out. We, we were one of the first sort of we call it settlers. We weren't settlers, but we were first to buy an estate out in Donvale, which was a new sort of suburb way back in the mid '70s, and there was a lot of orchards, but very much a participation area because you had you know new fields and new tennis courts being built, and yeah, you know, riding the bikes around, all that sort of stuff. So even though we were football fans, we were very much around the participation. But yeah, I don't think if you 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 can't fully understand what you're talking about no. if you're in this new generation. It's like you know, well, I, I just barrack for you now because I went to school and my, my mate barrack for the him and yeah. they're around the corner. But it's so tribal when when I was sort of growing up, yeah, you know, through that I was born in '63. So when I started, yeah, you know, getting a bit more interested in footy, I think I went to the '72 or the '73 Grand Final, Carlton versus Richmond, when when the one that Carlton won with a Richmond mate and he was shattered and I was happy so you understand the origins of the game which is which is so strong in in certain areas yeah speaking of Don Val and your childhood what uh, if you think about your parents and the lessons you had learned from them over the years is there something in particular that really stands out that they they taught you whether it's indirectly or directly at all it's probably only when you look back, I guess when you're a kid growing up, you're sort of immersed in your family and whatever you're doing. But, you know, when I look back on it, you know, my mum was really competitive. As I said, they were a real sports family, very much tennis family. You know, we played a lot of tennis. Um, my dad, my mum was really, really competitive and took us around and dropped us off at training. You know, it's a very traditional sort of upbringing back then, you know, where dad was off at work and, and mum was sort of you know, looking after the kids and all that sort of stuff. So I remember her dropping us off and picking us up and Dad coming home and working all day. And, and Dad was really studious, you know, work on all the working bees and on all the committees and, you know, Donbile Primary School and Beverly Hills Footy Club and all that sort of stuff. And and, and Dad, so Mum had this sort of competitive sort of spirit when I look back on Dad was all about fairness and playing the game properly and, and rules and all that sort of stuff. And I think I got the combination of both. Yeah. Um, yeah, people often talk about the fact that I was only reported once in my career, but I, but when I, I think when I look back on it, it was that that absolute you know adherence to the rules and and um, that my dad taught me, and my mum's just really competitiveness. So it's probably a combination of both. Mm. Yeah, I can see where the competitiveness would have helped in your play as a player, but also that sort of civic mindedness and the element of taking hold of responsibility that your dad would have shown through being in all these committees committees would have led to to your future career and, and what you did in football as well. Yeah, and, and I, I guess the other question I get asked um, is is leadership sort of, is it born with it or you, you learn sort of thing? I think you're right. I think, I think having my dad and seeing what he did and seeing him as a leader and a, a pillar of the community and you know, really well respected and doing lots of things, I think you learn, yeah, you obviously learn from your parents, you learn from your school teachers and your footy coaches and I think the biggest difference now when you look at this generation is our generation was all talk to, feel, touch, they were your role models. Now it can be mm. on Instagram or Facebook or through the, you know, through various you know, mediums that we didn't have back in those days. So, yeah, you learnt from the people around you and you learnt from their actions and what they did. So mm. there's no question learning from a dad, you know, whether it certainly was subconscious, wasn't conscious at the time, that, you know, the leadership that he, you know, and the organisation stuff clearly got through and, you know, that's one of the reasons I'm sure I became a became a captain of a footy club and became a coach. It's Yeah, I think you're definitely right. It's saying that um, you sort of have to build at an early age. It's just saying that you notice in differences of people. I, th- I also think it's also psychographic as well. Like there's just there's certain personality traits that lend people to being leaders as opposed to others. Like you, you have to be somewhat extroverted. You can't be an introvert to be a leader, I think. Um what sort of your earliest memory of wanting to take on real responsibility? I'm not sure. I think when you're a kid growing up, when I look back, it, it sort of just finds you. You know, I think when you're a kid, it's sort of, 
either kids gravitate to you, away from you, the coach gravitates to you, away from you, you know, teachers gravitate to you, away from you. And it's not a not a negative thing that they gravitate away from you. It, it, often it's the energy that you put out. So if you, if you want to be left alone, then people tend to leave you alone. If you want people to be drawn into you, then people get drawn into you. So I'm, I'm very big on that. Um, I, I think it was just my personality. I, I don't think I set out to be a leader. I don't, think I, I don't know whether I really captained many of the junior teams that I was involved in, whether that's mm. basketball or, or football. I think I'd captained a few of them. Um, but I guess through my actions, I was always um, someone that understood games really well. I, I think one of my greatest strengths as a footballer was my knowledge of the game and ability to to, to sum it up really well and I was similar as a basketball player I played state basketball and state football um, so they were the, the two main sports so I was always a really good thinker of the game mm. um, even in tennis I was probably you know um, I was pretty reasonably talented but I was, I was at least able to work out the strategy of a game I've always been able to do that so I think that was more my leadership style back then was less less vocal but more the fact that people could see that I knew the game and I really understood the game well. And do you, because one thing you mentioned in a few interviews is this passion for leadership. Do you think, like, what is it that you think you get out of it? Is it the thrill of getting a group of people to achieve something or is there something else there? Because I often find that what I loved about elements of leadership is the, not camaraderie, just the feeling that you got from people if that makes sense. Yeah, I think there's stages. I think as a captain, it's really different. As a captain, um, you know, you, you're directing and driving, but ultimately you've got to be, you know, a good role model and do things really well first and foremost as, a, as an AFL captain. And, you, and you're still preparing yourself, you know, even, even mm. the most selfless AFL football player, you're still selfish because unless you've got a... Yeah, you have to be. Uh, you have to be selfish in order to be able to be the best possible player. So first and foremost, you've got to look after yourself. And then with that comes the responsibility of the rest of the team. And I think, look, I, yeah, team sports is wonderful. You know, it's wonderful to be part of it. The, you know, I think I've been fortunate to be part of... You know, something great, whether that's winning or losing, it's just the team camaraderie. It's just the ability to lean on each other and have conversations and have people around you and help you out and things like that. I think we take it for granted as footballers as or in a team sport. You yeah, know, I, I definitely would say that. I think a lot of footballers realise that when they retire. 100%. And, and, yeah. and doing a lot of what I'm doing now, I think I realise how fortunate I am. And I think that's probably part of what corporates strive to do but don't really understand how to do it yeah. and having seen it just having some great friends yeah still involved in footy and I had a wonderful experience just recently where I went and visited an, an old trainer Jack Hancock I saw that yeah, yeah and and just sitting there and and going through Linda his daughter and and we sat there with Jack and Linda brought an old scrapbook and again I think that just reinforced to me how fortunate I was when I looked at yeah, you know, the pictures of Brett Stevens and Alistair Lynch and Laurie Serafini and Mickey Conlon and Bernie Quinlan and Gary Wilson and Purdy and I think I just realised how strong that connection is when you're involved in a team sport because you're giving of yourself to each other and you're helping each other through. So that was a really good moment that I had just recently just to remind me of how important those connections are. Yeah, I think one thing I've realised with that in the parallels between football and business and I do it's saying that I never think the business will be able to fully implement just because of the nature of business. At the end of the day, someone hires someone. You can't just, like in football, you can cut someone at the end of the year. You can't just do that with an employee. There has to be certain things that have to be met and, and repercussions if you want to get someone, get rid of someone essentially. And I felt like the, the element of accountability is so unique in football because it's just so cutthroat. And people, you know, like how how can corporations get around that sort of tiptoeing behavior, you know, that, that element where they don't want to tell the truth or be honest because they're worried about fair work or this or that. How do they sort of get honest about their communication that, that clubs often do? 
Yeah, it's a really good point. I think the starting point is, and the transition in AFL footy sort of happened in the mid-2000s, where the players really got involved in their footy club. You know, we did it at Sydney. We were probably the first club to do it. And you, you, you've got to have a clearly defined purpose, values, and behaviours. And, yeah. and most companies sort of have their mission statement, their purpose. Then the next level is their values. But very few companies go break it down because integrity might look different to you than it was to, to me. So if we're sort of staying at that surface level, it's then very hard to reward and challenge. It's very hard to be really specific on what's ex- accepted. and and. But if you get below that, which footy clubs are great at doing, these is, this is the way we act. And then you've got your technical KPIs as well, which is going to be different for each footy club and different yeah. for each business. And then you marry them up together and then you've got a clear roadmap. And I think the biggest thing I see is a lot of companies don't really have a clear roadmap about how they they're act. And I talk about being a process-driven company or an outcome-focused. Great footy clubs are just process-driven. This is what we do on a daily basis. Yeah. This is how we perform on the weekend. And then if you're really clear on what your technical KPIs are and your, and your behaviours that go along with it, it's really easy to challenge and reward. And then I talk about acting your way into the system, acting your way out of the system. And I think to your point with the HR model and et cetera, et cetera, people just act their way out of a system because mm. they they see so much clarity around how people act in the business that eventually they go, I don't want to be part of this business. But too often I think it becomes a little bit too hard for companies to do it so they don't actually have any sort of reward or, or, or challenging and they just let it go and let it go and let it go. And yeah. if you've got good people, then fundamentally you're going to be okay. you know. But what what – I like to do is is sort of say, well, how do we harness the good people and how do we work out what the behaviours look like and then how do we put a really clear process in place where we know exactly what's accepted and, and, and what's not accepted. And if you do that, um, I don't care if it's a footy club or people selling cars or shoes or whatever it is, if you're really clear around how people act, um, it's a really simple process to put in place. Mm. There's two things there. It's the, the process versus goals and... It sounds like there's structurally something there as well in in football clubs as opposed to companies. So, you know, in a company, a lot of the times you you get classic structures where you've got, you know, upper management, middle management and, and lower staff. In football clubs, is it quite different, do you think? Like you've, you've literally just got coaching body and then playing body or le- and leadership group as middle management in between? Or do, how did you change that element when you're at Sydney? Yeah, I think I think if you call the I mean call the players the workers or whatever they are, I think I think you're right. I mean the, there's gonna be different structures at different companies, but it doesn't really matter. Whatever that structure is, if you can get buy in from and it's got to start with the leaders, whatever the leaders are, you know, you've got to get buy in from them and what what's acceptable, what the behaviours are. Um, so it's gonna vary from company to company. But if I stick to footy, yeah, we 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 did the exercise with sort of the 50 people, the coaches, players, everyone in the same room together. There's probably 50 to 60 people. And then we decided what we want to stand for, what our behaviours are. Um, and then you you reward them and you challenge them. And I think it's the accountability model that's so strong, you yeah. know, in footy clubs. There's no there's no question. And I think um, I think the reason it doesn't happen in corporates is it's because it's – people just don't put time aside to do it. Um you know, I've spoken at a couple of companies and I've asked them, you know, I've spoken on team and the question I always ask is how often do you get your team together and oh, once once a year, once every two years. So even Jeez. that simple concept of what a team is, you know, that simple concept of what culture is and what leadership is, I think the great thing is there's a real desire to learn and there's a real desire to implement, there's a real desire to get better and that's what I'm seeing out there. But I think, you know, we talk about um, – competence and character or transaction and relationship. Yeah, a lot of leaders become leaders because they're really good at what they do. They're very transactional. They're very competent in their technical skills. And then they get rewarded, rewarded, rewarded. What happens is suddenly they're looking down one day and they've got 10, 15, 20, 30, 100 people they've got to manage. And they simply just haven't been given the skills along the way to be able to do that. Um, and that's there's no question that's one of the greatest challenges at the moment. Mm. There's two things I want to touch on. We'll come back to process and goals in a minute, but buy-in. I I found this to be an interesting topic because I felt like, you know, you were named Australian Father of the Year in 2008. Um, There is no better parallel to get buy-in than having kids. 
<laughs> so I'm curious as to, and, and it seemed that in a lot of interviews you spoke about making decisions together as a family, which I, I found quite interesting. So I guess what is your perspective as a parent? How did you view that principally going into it? Yeah, probably the first fallacy is this notion of work-life balance. I mean, <laughs> to sort of think that that's my work and that's my home, it's your life. It's it's not yeah. work-life balance. It's life balance because that's <laughs> your life. I always found it quite amusing. Well, how do you get work-life balance? Well, you don't. It's your life. Yeah. So you're balancing your life. And I, I think that's as soon as you get that in your head – as a CEO, a footy coach, a player, or a, a sales rep, or, or whatever, then how do I get my life in order? That's a really good starting point. You know, so for me, that was the first stage. What I'm doing is with my family, regardless of what I do, that's my life. Yeah. So then, yeah, you know, the starting point is that. And then my kids were young when I took over at, at Sydney, but yeah, you know, we still engage them in the conversation and still spoke about it. And then if we're doing this together collectively, what part of my job can they be involved in? What part of my job can't they be involved in? Yeah. You know, and then you're making completely different decisions if you're looking at as your your life balance, not your work life balance. So that, that's probably the be- best tip I can give is. Yeah, clearly my kids were never going to sit in the coach's box with me and, <laughs> and coach and, so. and sitting in meetings and all that sort of stuff. So there's clearly going to be restrictions for everything you do. But I think if you're including your family in what you're doing, then it becomes so much easier that when you're not getting home, you don't have to drop your work because mm. it, it, you, it is your work. Your, your work is – so that's probably the biggest way I looked at it. Um, yeah, we decided to stop and then I decided to do it again, asked the boys and spoke to them about it. So I think the fact that we had that as a starting point was was really good. Mm. Yeah, because it's, it's things that Lauren and I think about as we get to a stage when we'll probably have kids. I'm curious as to have your boys ever spoken to you about that fact that they've appreciated it or that – um, it just really helped them give clarity on what, how, how they fit into the picture. Like, I guess that's what I'm curious about. Yeah, definitely. No, um, look, we just did a, a book um, called The Fatherhood. So, and Dylan and I sat down for the interview and did it together. So it was really cool listening to him. And I, I think again, it's his perspective. And he, and one of the things he said is, look, well, Dad was just always there. You know, he just always turned up. Um, yeah, we knew if he couldn't, but most of the time he'd get on a, you know, he'd get on a you know, midnight flight from Perth, and he'd arrive at six a.m. and you know, get out and he'd turn up at our footy game. Or so that was really cool to hear that they <laughs> they found that um, it wasn't an effort; it's just what I did. It's because I wanted to do it. So yeah, I, well, I didn't do it consciously. I did it because I I wanted to spend time with my family. Mm. I wanted to put as much time into my work as I possibly could. Um, you know, and and to. Yeah, the moments for me are the greatest moments is to have them on the field, you know, winning 05, you know, premiership. You know, when I took the – one of the main reasons I took the job at Melbourne is I remember, you know, I came home, I met with the leadership group and I started getting text messages from a number of the leaders um, and, and Dylan was, you know, what, 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 what's that, mate? You know, so I had a text message from Jack Grimes and Jack Trengove and – and Dylan goes, Dad, you have to do it. You know, you, you just have to do it. They they deserve more than what they're getting sort of type thing. So, yeah, and, and so to have him say that, um, you know, I, I probably didn't coach Dylan as much as I did Tyler. Yeah, and to have Tyler talk about the impact that it had on him and his footy career and all that sort of stuff. So, and I think the other message that I try to portray is don't think it has to be something massive. Don't wait for the holiday in Aspen or the, the holiday mm. to Disneyland or the Hawaii or whatever. Just, just do it. Just do it. You know, we used to have breakfast together every Thursday morning and then I'd drop them off at well, our, you know, public school, primary school. Um, I'd get to training most nights and either help, them, help the other coaches or whatever. So don't wait for the big moment because mm. the big moment might never turn up, yeah, you know. Yeah. So just get into a really good rhythm. I think saying no is really important as well, you know, learn how to say no. But, yeah, hearing your kids talk about it and the impact that it had, you know, clearly I've made some mistakes as well. But, you know, I think they would never say that I wasn't there and, and didn't try and make an effort to do that. Mm. Yeah, I think it, it – the fact that you'd realised at an early stage that 
life wasn't work-life balance, it was just life balance, is one of the crucial components because a lot of people just segregate the two. It's like my work face and my home face, if that makes sense. Uh, It absolutely does. I mean, last year I went to a conference called Nurture Her, um, which we're now involved in, and and that was, again, was a real eye-opener that that, um, people were there with just, you know, going, I guess, for a you know, a conference and to learn from speakers and all that, but it became a real life changing event. Hmm. Yeah, you know, because I think, you know, depending on what those messages were, it was, you know, look after yourself, you know, look after what's the leader look like, what's a business person look like. And I think a lot of them realize that this is not just about me at business. This is about how I operate as a human being, how hmm. I operate as a person, you know. So that was really life changing for me. Um, and then finding a group of like minded people and and making some change. So there's no there's no question. Just just I just want to be a better person, which is going to impact my work. It's going to impact me as a husband, as a wife, as a father, you know, as a football coach, as, as in the local community, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think if we if we take a, a different view of what we're doing and when we're doing it and how we're doing it and look at it just as personal development in an overall sense, I think we change our perspective quite significantly. Mm. Speaking of um, wives, I think you recently celebrated your uh, 26th wedding anniversary. Uh, What have you learnt from Tammy? I think uh, meditation would definitely be up there, right? (laughs) Yeah, no, definitely. Look, I think um, probably the main thing is – it's great when you marry your best friend, you know, someone yeah. you get on really, really well with. I mean, that's a really good start. And I said this at a, a conference not while, not that long ago. Um, marry someone that's that's got similar views and similar interests, et cetera, et cetera. That's probably the biggest thing for us. Um, we, we get on so well together as a couple. Um, and then obviously the meditation journey, you know, I'm probably more in the head. She's more in the heart. So, you know, Pulling, I try to pull her a little bit to the head. She pull, pulls me a little bit to the heart. So that's probably our only, and it's not a dramatic difference, but it's just where we sort of swing it between. Well. Yeah, compliments, and I'm I'm getting better at the heart, um, which is really good, and she helps me do that. And I think that's where leadership is going anyway. So, yeah, for her to be part of that, and we didn't push it down anyone's throat at the Sydney Swans. We just had her, you know, optional meditation stuff with some of the senior players. Some of the younger players did it, and then when we when she came to when I came to Melbourne. You know, I spoke to Dave Misson about it, who ran a high performance program and made sure he was comfortable with, you know, Tammy coming in. He was like, yeah, this is great. And I think it was around about the time that everyone started thinking about the, the being present and the mindful and wellness and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I think the best way, as you said, we, we sort of get on really well, but we also complement each other really nicely. Yeah. Do you find that, because um, I know you used to, you probably still do now today, but before matches you would you would meditate. Um, I'm guessing you meditate daily, right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, yeah. you know, five out of five out of seven, six out of seven every day, sort of thing. So yeah, look, yeah, one of my routines was to meditate the day of the game, and and I think it was the number of times that after the meditation, I I sort of go into a meditation thinking, what am I going to say to the players today, or what are we going to do, or how are we going to go, <laughs> or whatever. And there's no doubt. But by doing that, getting real clarity around the message and, you know, calmness, et cetera, et cetera. And it certainly kept me grounded a lot during the game as well, which is obviously so high pressured, you know, when, you, when you've got two hours to sort of perform or not perform. And, you know, so to remain present in that moment, to remain grounded and hopefully win, lose or draw, to be able to be as non-emotional as you possibly can in a very, very emotional environment. Jumping back to processing goals, this is um, something that I have learnt in a big way in the last year, I'd say. And I think it was reading a book by Scott Adams. Um, It wasn't How to Win Bigly. It was about his life. I can't remember the name of it, but it was where he articulated that the focus on the process was more beneficial than goals because by the time you get to the goals, you sort of get that, that initial period of, you know, you're ecstatic and then it's gone immediately. How did you at at Sydney, how do you, when you speak to companies, how do you convince them, first of all, to focus on the process, but how do you articulate what is, you know, when you go from a KPI focus to that that general process focus? Yeah, look, I think it's one of the, the great things, maybe not myself, but people wrestle with, you know, short-term goals, medium-term goals, long-term goals. And 
and I'm probably more process driven. I'm more the goals will look after themselves. You've got to have an understanding of where you want to get to, and right. certainly that's not my expertise. But at Sydney, you know, I know the CEO would have a three year plan, a five year plan, all that sort of stuff. But I think if you really know what makes a good day and you know what the process is, your goals are going to look after themselves. So it's always going to be a balance of the two um, because obviously if you make the goals too big and you don't look like you're going to get there, you start to get really disappointed. Having said that, you can always adjust your goals. And I know there's there's probably a great debate. I I definitely lean on the side of process. You know, what, what do I have to do to make it a good day? And if I don't have a good day, I know the next day I've got to make X amount of phone calls or we've got to train on this side of our game. And there's a technical side as well. So the message that I give to corporates is, you know, often what makes a good day? You know, if, if you have enough good days, you're going to have a good month. And if you have a good enough month, you're going to make budget, <laughs> you know. So it, it's a pretty simple process. But I think we all waver between the medium, short, you know, short, medium, long-term goals and what that daily process is. Yeah, I think it's it's the difference between lag and lead measures. I think when you become focused on lead measures, the the process, you, you really – like as an example with our podcast, I used to be upset, like not obsessed, but I used to always look at download numbers and that was my measure. It was when I started focusing on a few key things which were process driven that would improve the podcast and that was an hour reading every night, so getting more informed about certain topics that we'd interview people on. It was at least one interview a week and it was at least reaching out to one person a week about an interview. And so that was, it was when I changed that focus that I really started noticing the difference. People were more engaged, they were more interested in what we were doing, and then the download numbers just sort of stem from that, I found. Yeah, look, it's a really good point. I think if you look at footy in relation to that, it, it, you can get really uh, comfortable when you win. Now, your behaviours yeah. might be really bad, you know, and I talk about talent-based teams and uh, character-based teams, behavioural-based teams. You know, talent-based teams can always win, but when the talent drops, you know, then you start losing. Behavioural-based teams that just act really well, when one player goes out, is a good player, you, clearly your, your, ta- your talent's going to drop a little bit, but it's not going to be this roller coaster ride when you're you know, finishing first and you're down at 18th and then you're back up the second and it's purely simply based on your talent. So to your point, you know, if we get our behaviours right in a game and often often the most um, critical we are is when we win because mm. it's a great opportunity to, to look at yourself and go, well, we might have won today, but we actually won because the other team was just bad. They just played really bad. We didn't play that well. So it's the ability to scrutinise yourself and be really clear on what that looks like. And then as you said, if you get your content right, yeah, you might end up with with five really good guests and just the guest wow people. So but then if the content's not great, then all of a sudden you get a lower profile guest and the numbers just drop as opposed to when those good guests are on, the content's great. Yeah. And then you're able to get really good contact with that lower profile guest and people say, oh, I didn't know much about Fred Smith, but wow. Yeah, we get that a lot these yeah, days. Yeah, exactly. and, that, and that's what has been the biggest change, you know. And they might, may not have as big audiences as other guests, but it's, you know, when you have like a chief scientist of Australia who's nearly 80 and he's got no audience yep. and he's an organist, but people are all of a sudden fascinated by the fact that he plays, uh, you know, the organ down at the church or whatever. That's when you really start to go, okay, we're doing something right. Yeah. And if you're a talent-based team, it's similar. I, I don't really worry too much about the organist because I'm not relying on the organist. I'm, I'm just relying on the, the high profile full four that kicks eight goals. <laughs> but then when he's out, I suddenly got to focus on the organist and I don't actually know what to do. So my, and my audience is going to be the same. So it's a really yeah. good analogy that, you know, get your content right. So when you're coaching the great full forward and the, you know, the, the role player back pocket, everyone's getting coached the same. And then when the people are watching the game, they're going, okay, well, I know the full forward's not playing today, but gee, the game still looks pretty similar yeah. and I'm still really interested in the, in the game itself. Well, I think uh, amongst that is a good use case for transforming an organisation. So, obviously, t- 2013, you took over as head coach at Melbourne. I think in there was somewhere in an interview there where you spoke about how you thought you believed that the players were so worried about the outcome, and, and in this case, it was the scoreboard, and it would almost become like this black dog of fear on their back. 
So how did you, how do you, or when someone's out of business and they're wanting to transform the culture, where do you start? Yeah, it's a good point. And round two in uh, my first year of coaching Melbourne, yeah, we played at uh, MCG and I was reminded by it the other day by a Melbourne supporter, which was (laughs) nice of him. And we lost by 98 points. And a lot of the guys that I brought with me coaching were all Sydney Swans uh, coaches or players, ex-players, Benny Matthews and uh, Daniel McPherson, Brett Allison, George Stone. And and to be fair, we'd we'd never seen anything like it really. Um, And you could physically see the players changing. As the as the scoreboard started ticking over, you could physically see it in their body language. Yeah. You know. So what that taught me was just just when when we coached the players in the first two years in particular, it was what can I do at, at that next stoppage what can I do at that next kick in and be really clear on what that process is guys don't worry about the outcome if we get a goal kicked against us go and stand there that's what we're asking to do and Max or whoever the ruckman was Jake Spencer or or Mark Jamer just hit it down there that's what we're asking you to do you know and someone else stand there and someone else stand there but typically and if you look at a good team that's what happens but typically what was happening at Melbourne there was just that lack of trust in each other so no one moved because they didn't want to win. But, well, I don't really trust the Ruckman to hit it there. So I think the other Ruckman will hit it there. So I'll move there. And then the other guy, instead of telling that guy to move back to his spot, would he'd move as well. Yeah. It's and like a then, negative feedback loop. Yeah. So then all of a sudden the Ruckman would hit it where he was supposed to hit it, but <laughs> no one was there. You yeah. Know? So that's it's a great example of process. So we spent a lot of time just just on the place. Guys, don't worry about the scoreboard. And, I, and they would tell you, I used to joke about this all the time. I don't know why they found it funny. I said, guys, there's a guy in the scoreboard. His job is to yeah. push the button. That'll look after itself. You don't have to worry about the scoreboard. What you have to worry about is what happens at the next contest, when the next ball's kicked in, when the next ball, you know. And that's what I love about football. And I say this to the corporates all the time. Now, go and watch a game of footy, regardless of whether you support. It's a great helicopter view of how business operates. You know, do the players trust each other? Do you see a sustainable brand that every time something happens, it's predictable? What are the habits, et cetera, et cetera? But to your point, we really had to focus a lot on the process. We had to focus on, yeah, what were the micro moments in every single game and what could you impact and what couldn't you impact? Mm. And obviously it took a, a fair while to get that across. Yeah, it's, it's very, very hard. It's, it's to that point again about lead versus lag measures. To, to take someone who's for years has looked at only how many calls they should be making or how many dollars they should be making a month to then change it to something else is very, very hard. It's like a learned habit. Any habit is hard to change. Oh, 100%. Exactly. Yeah. And I guess in a, in a footy sense, you know, when they arrive at 18, yeah, that's where it starts, you know. So it's very hard to break habits. Um, so if you've got a certain way of doing things from sort of 18 to 22 and then suddenly a different coach comes in, it does – and some players can't change. And to your point, even in, in work, some players – workers can't change because they're just used to thinking dollars. They're not used yeah. to thinking number of phone calls. So they just go by the wayside. But you know, my experience tells me the more you can stay at that process level, then, then everything's going to look after everything's going to look after itself. Because we just you, you mentioned before habits. Because mm. just ha- really good habits are formed. And then when someone new comes in, what they do is look at the habits and they go, okay, that's yeah, everyone wants to fit in when they get to the best person to ask about your culture, and we do this all the time, is the, the most recent person that comes into your organisation yeah. because they're not blurred by whatever that purpose is or whatever that value is that's set on the wall. And I say this all the time. At the end of the first week or the second week and you know, you go down to a cafe with your husband or your wife or whatever and, and, and they say, well, what, you know, tell us about work, they're going to try and fit in. Yeah, you know, they're not going to go with the, the the non-conforming crew. They're not going to go at the end of the week, oh, you know, five people turned up on time and 25 didn't. They're going to go, oh, it looks like for me to fit in, I'm probably going to have to be 10 minutes late to every meeting. Yeah, you know, we don't really make many phone calls back on time. Or, so it's what they see. It's not what they see on a wall. Oh, great. Gee, everyone dresses this particular way. I've noticed everyone's really attentive in meetings. Yeah, you know, I've noticed that people turn up five minutes early to all the meetings. So, of course, the next week, what are they going to do? Yeah. They're going to dress really nicely. They're going to turn up to their meetings. Yeah, so that's what your culture is. And yeah. the, and as I said, the, the best person to ask is the most recent person that comes in the organisation. Yeah, and the only person that can truly change it if, if it needs to be changed is the person 
at the top by leading by example. Yeah, and I talk about um, yeah, leaders as role models. You know, if your business card didn't say CEO of such and such company, but it said head le- head role model of such and such company, how would you act? Yeah, you'd yeah. act dramatically different. So I'd love to see the business cards. Point. Yeah, I'd love to see the business cards of all the all the CEOs and all the leaders change to, to head role model. I'm the head role model of such and such, and I think you know a lot of what we're seeing that's that's negative. You know, it comes from the not necessarily comes from the CEO, but it, but to your point, it's their responsibility. A lot of the positive stuff, you know, when I'm sure when you talk to people in the workplace, I do, oh, you know, this is a great place to work, and I go, why? Because oh, the CEO is such a, you know, he's, he comes into my office, really interested yeah. in what I do. He's really invested, asks about my wife, my kids, my husband, or whatever it might be. Um, there's no question if if you if you want to have a great culture, it starts with the the head role model. Yeah, and that that is such a good one because I think that in some businesses, particularly when they're big, the bigger it gets, the harder it is to be a role model. Uh, you can sort of distance yourself from from those people. So I guess that raises my thought. I was I was thinking about what is Paul's principles for leadership, and you know, like you guys have an interesting thing on performance by design. We talk about alignment, feedback, and then accountability. I feel like we've in different ways discussed it already but if you were to principally break that down how do you when you go into a company you do your talk you consult with them what do you think about what are the top things there yeah well clearly i mean bringing their behaviors to life i mean if they haven't got them you need to have real clarity about how you're going to act yeah so that's that's probably the number one thing it's very hard to create a culture if no one's really sure about how we act and how we challenge and how we reward and i see that see that a lot so getting the real clarity around that is extremely important. Yeah, when I talk about leaders, and we touched on it before, leaders have to be role models. Communication and honesty is huge. You know, mm. I always talk about leadership is exhausting. You know, it's not easy. You know, sometimes I go to these conferences and listen to speakers and I get down and I sort of think, I reckon you're given a false view of what a leader has to do. A leader has to be connected and, and build relationships. And, and the, one of the things that I did, which is really valuable in, in a long-winded answer to your question, is I wrote down the 25 – it happened to be 25 points of things I liked about my leaders and things I didn't like about my leaders. And a lot of it re- relates to what we do at Performance by Design now. But if you break it down to specifically leadership, and I reread it the other day, and um, it's really good to look back on, you know, and some of the things that, you know, about the, the you know, never fly off the hand, laugh for a game if you've, if you've got nothing positive to say. So if you break that down from a corporate sense, under pressure, it's how you act under pressure. Yeah, when, when everything's coming at you, whether that's the, the shareholders, the board, etc., how am I acting under pressure? You know, the energy of the coach will rub off onto the energy of the players. The energy of the CEO is going to rub off on the energy of the whole organisation. You know, never drag a player from making a mistake. And if you translate that to, you know, to business, no one goes in to have a bad day. You know, so those were really good principles when I look back on it and fundamentally make up, you know, my philosophy, our philosophy, as well as the, the purpose, values and behaviours. And as I said yeah leaders are role models we talk about that all the time Mm. communication is a big one every single piece of leadership related books and i think a lot of this stems from sort of the tech field or sports teams or military groups today like a lot of the books that i've read on leadership uh have been from specialist like navy seal type teams and i think the biggest thing is uh, communication, an important element of that is having everything free, like a free flow of information. So as an example, in a lot of SEAL teams, they have the entire briefing from every single unit in the group available for anyone to read at any one point in time. Um, and I've noticed that in the companies I've worked with uh, or worked for, the best ones always just have like not a compendium, but just information constantly, constantly flowing. Um, so I guess I'm curious, how do you think about communication flow? When is t- when is it too much of a fire hose and what's just the right amount? 
internally. Yeah, it's going to vary from company to company a little bit, but I, I absolutely agree. I mean, transparency, creating a safe environment. There's a lot of you know information around creating a safe environment. You, we talk about it all the time at Performance by Design, and and we, what we call is real talk. You know, if you create a safe environment for people to to step up and and talk, then your conversations become real. You know, and, and then they become about the information that's flowing backwards and forwards. Yeah, I think too often, and I think it's changing. I, I really one of the great things about this generation is they want information. They thrive on information. Yeah. Well, you when know, you grow up with an iPhone and yeah, you expect and it, and you expect <laughs> it, so people are expecting to be you know rewarded and challenged, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when when's enough and when's not enough? Again, it varies from. But I, I think the notion of yeah, you know, for us. You know, when I hear things like, you know, we've, we've had this anonymous feedback and we've done this anonymous feedback, well, they, there's something wrong with your company. Yeah. You know, if you've got to have anonymous feedback in your company, um, there, there's a big problem in your company. Yeah. Now, I understand the value of it sometimes, and that, and that may be, um, you know, but, but if that's the, the panacea for your success of your company is anonymous feedback – then you've got some big, big problems. Yeah, and I think to that, there's a lot of people who don't like friction, and friction is what leads to improvement. So, um, yeah, I, I often f- it's always interesting um, just speaking to different business leaders when you notice that, like, you know, the anonymous feedback thing is strange. It's always been strange to me. Uh, look, I think, uh, yeah, I understand the value behind it. And maybe what it tells you is we've got to do something pretty dramatic because mm. this anonymous feedback, we want to become, you know, open feedback, you know, open feedback. And I think the notion too, sometimes footy clubs get a bit of a bad rap, some of the things we do, because most of the stuff that is in terms of feedback is, oh, you know, such and such discipline someone and someone got discipline. Most of the stuff we do is positive. It's a lot of it positive feedback. Yeah, well, so I guess not, that doesn't sell uh, eyeballs. No, that's it? right. So I think I think that's what people scares people. Most of the stuff at work should be positive feedback. Well done, because if you're giving positive feedback all the time, people are hearing it, listening to it, and someone goes, oh, "Okay, now I understand what we're getting rewarded for." But Australians typically aren't great at receiving positive feedback either. No. So what do we what does it, we turn into? A bit of sarcasm, a bit of laughter, and <laughs> you know, a bit un- uncomfortable. So what? we talk about a lot is you know when you're giving feedback give it directly give it someone's eye and when you're receiving it all you need to say is thank you i really appreciate that feedback you Mm. know yeah not be nasty about it not be nasty about it or not be sarcastic or even laugh if it's positive sort of thing so again a lot of its stuff is positive feedback how how do we get better as an organization how do we get better as a football club and even in, in the midst of you know the early days of melbourne you know we weren't winning a lot of games but a lot of the feedback was positive because for us to change behaviour, we had to show what the really good stuff was in the course of losing a game of football. So we had to s- spend a lot of time doing that, positive feedback, positive reinforcement, and then players would tend to gravitate to it. And to that point, most studies in psychology have shown that positive feedback loops always benefit a group more than negative yeah, or, I think or an individual. Yeah, I think it's four to one. My mom and my business partner yeah. tells me he's a bit more of an academic than me, four to one feedback. Yeah. And he also tells me that there's a study in America that's been done on the number of high fives in a game. And the more for high fives, the more likely you are to win. So, yeah. The, Really? Yeah, apparently. So the, well, look, whether it's causal though. that's, that's Yeah, a, no, exactly. But it's a really good point. You know, I think – too often we go through the course of the day and even simple little things by, you know, talking to someone, say, oh, Paul, mate, thanks for what you said in the meeting yesterday. That was really positive. That was really good. We just walk past and we keep moving. Even those – and I don't know, even why, know we, why we call them little moments, but we do. But even those little moments in a day, stop, thanks very much, well done. It makes a huge difference to your organisation. Yeah, and I've, I've noticed so in the last – two years I've had to deal with having anxiety and one of the key elements you learn from learning mindfulness and CBT and all that is the differences between negative thoughts and positive thoughts and negative thoughts really remain in your head like that you can't get rid of them you ruminate etc so if you can focus on the positive or the positive element to that situation the thought can move on and you can continue on with with your day so to speak. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting, isn't it? I, I, I mean, it's human nature to dwell on negative stuff. Mm. And it's also human nature to point out negative stuff because we think by pointing out negative stuff, we're making people better. 
because it's it's a negative to a positive, if you know what I mean. So if they if you improve X, then I think we're going to get better. I always think to, the the better view is clearly you've got to work on your weaknesses. But as a footballer, what people's strength is always going to be what makes them great. You still mm. have to work on your negatives. But you don't want to work on someone's negatives to the point where their strengths become diminished because it's going to be your strengths in whatever those strengths are that's going to take you to where you get to. Clearly, you have to work on your deficiencies, but too often we think the best way to high performance is by saying, do this better, 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 Yeah. rather than, well, look, just work on that, but wow, keep on doing that. You know, what you're doing in that area is amazing. Yeah. You know, so it's, I suppose it's a bit of human nature to hang on to negative stuff, but also to, to focus more on negative stuff. Yeah, and scale that massively. I only learned that. I'd say in the last year or so, I mean, when we were doing the the business that the agency we run, this podcast, I always to think, oh, at some point I need to learn how to be a creative, whether it's making audio, video, whatever. It's just better that I get out there, do more podcasts, sell more clients and, and have the funds there for other people to be doing that as opposed to worrying about getting good at making a podcast. It's just irrelevant. Yeah, I mean, we had this discussion with someone this morning as well, is be careful that you don't try and be everything to everyone. Yeah, everyone's yeah. got their strengths and weaknesses, you know, but I think one of the things probably surprised me a little bit is how people are so reluctant to collaborate now. Everyone's pretty wants to pull their cards pretty close to their chest and whether that's IP or whether that's, you know, worried about someone else competing with them or et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I think, as we move into you know next year and beyond, et cetera, I think it's the companies that are prepared to really collaborate and really say, well, we, rather than me doing that, which we probably could, why wouldn't I get someone else to help us do that? And then we're going to be much better and I'm going to service my clients you know, way better. So to your point is what do you – because if you, if you do it the other way, often you, you move so far away from your strengths and people go, geez, that used to be a great company. I used to enjoy working with Ruzi, but – wow, they've, they've moved so far away from their expertise and I know they've broadened and they've probably got bigger. And Yeah. But I think... I, I don't think, have any interest. Yeah, in I don't really have any because I don't really trust them now to do what they did originally. You know, so there's a danger in doing that as well. Mm. You mentioned earlier about media. Um, how are you finding being a commentator these days? Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, it's been on the different side and I think I try to balance the... Yeah, the reality is the game and the reality is what a coach has to go through and what a player has to go through and and try and bring you know, that to, to the – so there's the actual commentating on the game, which is you know, when you when you do that, but then there's the you know, the on the couch and, and trying to get across to people what is Ross Lyon really going through, what is Nathan Buckley going through, what would he be telling his players in this situation, why are the players kicking it there, what's the – what's the disadvantage of not having a runner and limited interchange and all those sorts of things. So I think, I mean, my view is I've got an obligation to the listeners to, to try and get across exactly what those things are that are happening mm. and why they're happening. Yeah, and you, we were speaking before about um, getting eyeballs. I think there was an interesting, there was quite a few questions actually about the effect of social media because you would have begun coaching before these, I mean, back in, when did you start at Sydney? 2004? Uh, 2002, halfway through 2002, okay. yeah. So 2002, really the only, there was still not, the internet wasn't as widely available for most people, but I think by 2004, five we had things like MySpace, but it wasn't really until eight, nine that things like Facebook and Instagram started cropping up. Yeah. How, how have narratives in the football media changed and also how have, players come to terms with with the constant feedback loop that they're getting out there? Yeah, look, it's changed dramatically. I think, um, you know, I, I encourage players, not not just players, but I think what what's happening with the current situation is you're fully immersed all the time. I mean, mm. when you've got radio stations that are 24 hours a day and it's not like... Yeah, you pick up the paper now or every game's at 2.10 when I first started and there's one replay on a Saturday night. So to be a player now or a coach, is, you know, there's eyeballs on you pretty much the whole week or, or ears listening to the radio. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's definitely a lot harder from that point of view. I think, again, whether it's, whether it's business or whether it's football, one of the best things I did, and, and a lot of it was because 
you know, my wife is American. But taking myself out of Australia, I thought was just really valuable. And it always put in perspective what I was doing. I, I sort of got overseas and I realized, well, maybe footy's not that big. But more importantly, <laughs> it gave you opportunity to take yourself out of the business for a little while and just clearly think about it. And as I said before, is when I went to this event, Nurture Her, last year, what I noticed with the corporate people getting off site, it had a really significant impact on them because suddenly you're in this completely different environment and you're able to have a helicopter view of your life and your business, et cetera, et cetera. And that really hit me as well that, that – that the ability to extricate yourself from football because of all this social media um, is is never been greater. Take yourself out of it, and I'm sure in a in a corporate sense, there's a lot of pressure on people now. Don't stay on the treadmill. You know, get yourself out of that treadmill. Get you off the treadmill. Get yourself to look back and say, okay, well maybe that's not that big a deal, or maybe mm-hmm. I can do that. But if you're always on the treadmill. It's really hard to make clear decisions. Yeah, so moments of time away from work, whether it's Sundays, no work, whether it's traveling, events uh, like Nurture Her where you're getting away and and basically looking at your life from a big, biggest perspective, I think, is what, what you're talking about. Yeah, look, I, I've been to sort of conferences and, and again, without emphasizing it, they're always good, but what I've noticed is, is you know, it's, it's the Melbourne Entertainment Centre or uh, Exhibition Centre or <laughs> Sydney or whatever. You watch when someone, a speaker finishes, they typically walk out and everyone gets on their phone and everyone sort of makes their phone calls. And so then the, even the ability to digest that speaker is really difficult. When I went to Nurture Her and Nurture 360, which is the, the mix, Nurture Her is the, the all women's one, Nurture 360 is the mixed one. It was completely different. It just sort of struck me. As I said, last year I just went as a speaker and and it really was quite dramatic just to see suddenly this – and it sort of got me thinking, why is it so different when people are still connected to their work? And I was like, well, clearly when you're away from it, you're in this great place, you've got these great speakers – and you've got this great network of people, you're not worried about what's happening at work. You're, you're present. And I think that term presence really hit me then. So yeah. then the ability to be really conscious about what that speaker said, be really conscious about, oh, now there's Paul Ruse. I want to go and chat to him and, and sit around and say, look, what does that mean to me? It was quite dramatic. And I think, again, for me as a coach, getting overseas, was, I was – I was lucky to be able to do that. So getting to you know, Hawaii or getting to, to America, it enabled me to, to put that past year into perspective and to say, okay, well, this is what I need to do better. But, if, but I think if you stay here, and I remember talking, I think it might have been Rossi Lyon or John Longmire you know, when they first started. And one of the things I said, get overseas, mate. Go mm. away at the end of the season. Take yourself away. And that would be my strong advice for, you know, for how, where's, a, where's a place you can go that you're fully immersed in what you're doing and you're not connected to your, to your phone or you're connected to, to your work, et cetera, et cetera. Now, sometimes that's going to be an event. Sometimes it's going to be – Retreat. You know, well, sometimes I, I, I think snow skiing is one of the great – because if you don't – if you're not present, you can eat a tree, you know. <laughs> so, and I'm sure there's people that do it anyway. You know, I'm a hike, you know, a hike, or so it doesn't have to be always be massive. But again, there's real signposts along the way in your life, and that was a real signpost to me when I went last year to say, okay, this is probably more important than a business wellness retreat. This is actually a complete audit of people's lives that were there. There's the personal development, there's the networking, and there's always yeah, massive advantages. But as a result of that, it's a great opportunity to, to along with doing that, to, to give yourself a self-audit as to what you're doing. And that's going to vary from person to person and what that looks like. And Nurture Her and Nurture 360, where's that held? So they're, they're both in Fiji. Um, oh, okay. They're in October you know, one's from about the 17th to the 22nd. The other one's the um, 20 – they go back to back. So they run from sort of 17th through the 27th. Um, and, again, they're just really good, you know, business retreats, small, medium business entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs. Um, but, again, my, my advice to people is take the time to look after yourself. One of the great quotes I, I read and heard was, my health will determine the health of my business. Too often people go, oh, no, that's – I don't see that as important. If you can't, I always say, if you can't look after yourself, how can you possibly look after 
they can't possibly look after 44 players and yeah you know staff and and run a footy club and membership and if i can't look after myself how can i possibly look after i think and i think also your staff appreciate it you might say oh geez it's a bit extravagant or whatever what whatever that might look like as long as you're coming back as a better person don't underestimate the impact that has on your staff where they go oh well i'm glad paul went you know, went overseas at the end of the year and spent time with Tammy's family and he's just come back refreshed. And the last thing you want to do is just stay, as I said, stay in the business. So finding that vehicle to be able to do that is really important. Yeah, you become, you can become stagnant and stale. Absolutely, and I think, yeah. I think washing that out every now, once a year, I think is always a good a good thing to do. Um, I'm weary of time um, and I want to jump into some yep. more rapid fire questions. Uh First one for you is what do what do you not get asked in the media or in interviews that you wish you did? Um, I think probably more around what is Nathan Buckley going through. What I, I think the ability to I don't think we try to understand coaches enough. I think we're really easy to it's really easy to criticize them for doing this doing that and we don't want to get below the surface we, it, it's easy to stay at surface level it's easy to stay at well why did Nathan do this or why did Ross do this or why did John Longmire do this or Alistair Clarkson we're very surface level you know and I think the the the, the questions that I most like are where people become really quite inquisitive and I think don't underestimate and whether it's a footy coach or whether it's a CEO or whatever, don't underestimate the want to transfer information. Mm. Yeah, when I was coaching Melbourne, I wanted Melbourne people to know what we were doing. So it got frustrating when people wouldn't ask me the follow-up question or whatever, and it sort of always stayed at that surface yeah. level. You know, Yeah, it's always like uh, how, you know, I, I know what it is. There's something really weird about football media like that. There's sort of the, you know, you do your presses and... Well, it's so immediate now. And to be fair to the media, because it so quickly happens, it's very hard to get underneath the story. It's just easy to say, you know, do you think you'll play finals this year? Well, there's six weeks to go, you know, and the typical coach's response is always going to be, um, well, look, we're just taking it one, one week, week at a time. Yeah. But the follow-up question would be, oh, well, what, what's, what do you need to work on this week? You know, what do you think, you know, you can improve on? Can I come down and spend some time with you and, and just watch, et cetera, et cetera? And I understand the reason why, because it's so immediate now and it's it's just so um, easy to stay at that level because, you know, people always are interested in who's going to win the premiership and who's going to play in the finals and all that sort of stuff. But, yeah, you know, whether it's me as a coach or me as just a consumer, you know, the text messages I generally send off to, to, to fellow journalists and people in the media is when I've read a great story and I'll shoot something off and I go, mate, that was fantastic. I loved, you know, I loved what you did, what you did then. You know, Positive that, reinforcement. Yeah, yeah. And the, <laughs> yeah. And the, there's a great, you know, Player's Voice, which is a great platform now, which is first person, you know, players and coaches talking about th themselves, you know, and and giving of themselves. So they're the really good ones to learn because it's actually the players and coaches and people behind the scenes writing the article themselves. You know, they're the ones that are really fascinating. When you read something like that, you go, oh, okay, I didn't – I didn't know that. I didn't know yeah, that about yeah. such and such. So that a long-winded answer to your question, but that's <laughs> yeah, that's probably the way I see it. What does your morning and evening routine look like? Yeah, most mornings I get up and I meditate. Um, you know, I'm not a fast starter, but I like to I like to sort of set myself up, set my day up. If I have to get up early enough, then obviously you, you got to do it and you got to get out of the house, sort of thing. So, um, so I like to get up and meditate and start the day like that and try and you know put it in some sort of rhythm I guess that, that just gives me a nice rhythm at the end of the day I'm a pretty simple man you know I I like my wife and my family and my boys are a bit older now so they don't like me as much but <laughs> yeah look I just enjoy spending time at home and you know I like just relaxing watching telly and and then heading off to bed reasonably early um, other than uh, Fox Sports of course do you have a go-to uh, th show thing that you're watching to decompress at the moment I'm a massive Seinfeld fan. My wife would tell me I've watched every single episode about, um, you know, probably 10 times each. You know, I, I yeah. love, yeah, I love Seinfeld. That's my sort of comic relief. And, um, yeah, sport plays a big part as well. So, you know, if there's no sport on, it's hard. But I, I enjoy watching replays of the NBA or the NFL or whatever. But, yeah, if you said, 
Um, what's the go-to show? It'd be yeah, I'll be watching the Seinfeld. Episodes. Seinfeld's brilliant. I think um, Lauren and I watched that back to front. It it only took us about a month. It's pretty long. You forget how big yeah, a series I mean, yeah, it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, ten episodes per season or more. Ten uh, seasons. I yeah. Think. So well, the best thing is every now and then it doesn't happen much now, but. Once in a blue moon, I'll come across one that I've never seen. So that gets, that's an exciting moment. Really? But it doesn't happen much now. Okay. Um, best purchase under $200. Best purchase under $200. Oh, my goodness me. What would that be? Um, I, I always like the the heart rate monitor watch. I don't know. Just sort of, okay. I'm always being competitive, <laughs> you know. So I think just having that on the wrist, it keeps probably anything that keeps me a bit more accountable. Yeah. You know, so having that. Running around, um, you know, running around Elwood or Brighton, and then in Hawaii, where I've got my house in Hawaii, running around Capulani Park. Okay. Um, so that's something I'll, I'm always wary of where that is. I suppose it's, I suppose it's probably something where you go, where is that? Where 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 do I put that? Where do I put that? <laughs> when you think about that question, you always relate to something that you go, oh yeah, I'm always looking for that. It's always saying that you have to dig deep when you're asked on the spot. I find asking yeah. people, um, if you had to gift one book. And it can't be either of yours or Tammy's for Christmas this year. What would it be, and why? Uh, the Way of the Peaceful Warrior. I read years and years ago. Uh-huh. Um, it's on, my, it's Dan, on my list at the moment. Yeah, Dan Millman, Brett Stevens, a mate of mine who gave it to me years and years and years and years ago. Um, that's probably one of the most profound books um, I've read. So that'd be the that'd be the one. Okay. Last question for you. If you could have a billboard anywhere in Melbourne, where would it be, first of all? And then what would you put on it? Well, I'm lucky and I don't want to brag, but I have got a statue at the SCG. So (laughs) I don't know whether I'd replace that with a billboard if I can answer the question differently because I think probably for me that just represents something special, you know, having something like that – I suppose, in a sense, gifted to you, but it doesn't represent me. It represents the city and Sydney and Bobby Skilton and Stewie Maxfield and Richard Collis. And so I reckon that's pretty cool to be able to to have that that and to know it's 72 years and and represents – because I know what the moment meant to everyone and – to be able to have that enshrined, I don't, I don't see it as a statue of me. That I'm just the the person that happens to be standing there. Mm. So that's probably going to be greater than any billboard that anyone could ever put up, and any slogan that anyone could put up. <laughs> I like that. That's a good one. I wish at some point in my life I could get a statue. <laughs> uh, look, Ruzi, thanks so much for coming in. It's been um, a pleasure having you. Where can people find you on the internet? In the interwebs. Yeah, well, if you, I mean, the links for me, Performance by Design, the website, www.performancebydesign.co, um, the Nurture Group retreats, which I'm really proud of, www.nurtureher.com, mm-hmm. www.nurture360.com.au. So one's for the all women business leaders, the other one's a mixed one, um, which is really cool. Um, I do the Ruse Men's Wellness and Leadership Club, which I that's really right. enjoy as well, you know, and that's, and that's just really creating a safe space for for guys to come together and and we have functions four or five functions every year um so you could look that up as well which is which is great so a lot of stuff that i do as we've spoken about yeah is about helping leaders and evolving and, and all those sorts of things and i think people know where to find fox footy <laughs> <laughs> fox footy um definitely give you i think it's paul ruse one on instagram i think that's where you're most active on yep. social media these yeah days. and linkedin and all that stuff. yeah i'm not massive on i'm still learning about instagram but yeah and the linkedin and all that and a few um, dolphin shots here and there yeah and, and you know anyone that wants me to speak my management is the Fordham company. They've been really good to me as well. So they're, right. they're a great company. And um, so, yeah, I've been really fortunate to, to be involved with a lot of great people and still involved in some good companies. Ruzi, thanks so much for coming in. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thank you for making it to the end. Before you run off, subscribe if you enjoyed this episode or do leave us a rating. For Instagram, go follow us on at uncommon underscore podcast. For YouTube, search Uncommon Podcast and don't forget to subscribe if you're watching this video. Also, give us a like or leave a comment on what you thought about the episode. But until next time, thanks so much for listening.